Bulk of marrow, weight of muscle, O swimming bone. Front matter one, O hail what see, these 200 landscapes toward the cadet. The image of the tiger reveals the truth of eating, the Thai 40. The following is an account of the nature and actions of the cadet. They, a paradoxical body, holograms of me, both physical and absolutely virtual. Confused dynamic athleticism, condemned to the limitless personifications of splendor. These idols are consequence, wandering corollaries of the raptures of old gold. The cadet operate as solvent, the frenetic movement of a hand, the silent collapse of a trachea, communicating immediate deformation to their surroundings through charm and hex. Under the influence of their movement, the environment sags, growing dented through an ongoing series of these locomotive mercurial, mercurial rites. They are numbed, flaccid, stumbling, cyclical engines of disfiguration. These bodies, terminal manifestations of prodigious abundance, are the most suited of all living beings to consume intensely, sumptuously, the excess energy offered up by the pressure of life to conflagurations befitting the solar origins of its movement, the Thai 37. These walking flesh rituals, turning away from the fixity of dust to leave yawning wastes in the sensible. These transcendental capacities are materially situated. Their physical indications of limb and organ describe a fundamentally dynamic, awkward maladaptation that enables the production of the frivolous, the unnecessary, the pleasing, the sensory for their own sake, grows seven. These gesticulations deform both what is sensed and the mechanics of sense. A cadet jogging through an opening between trees, the gate wide, crude, unreasonable. High, grease-matted polyester shorts flap rhythmically upon knotted gray thighs. This discordant gesture forming the initial unit of a causal linkage that molds the spherical contours of a witness's eye into an oblong cylinder, vision thereby growing long, the data transmitted to the senses from the sculpted lens now proportionally distorted under the influence of the cadet's radiating heterological athleticism. With each footfall, the lateral head of the calves convulse, turning slightly inward before arcing back under the sway of the tread. In communion with this undulation of the leg's tissue, the witness's sternum now portrays its own shape, abandoning familiar contours, physicality deviating to splendor. Simultaneously, a neutral, unmodulated eye would receive the earth waxing limp under the footfalls of this sweatless hallucination of a body, the properties of light itself bending traitorous upon the surfaces of its ridiculous being. I insist on the fact that there is generally no growth, but only a luxurious squandering of energy in every form. The history of life on Earth is mainly the effect of a wild exuberance. <coughs> the dominant event is the development of luxury, the production of increasingly burdensome forms of life, the Thai 33. The cadet perform and distribute their transformations doggedly, senseless, toward dissipation and fruitless rearticulations. The culture of their lodge a paradox, severe structure laden with inscrutable rigor though devoid of any agenda beyond boundless squander. A militant embarrassment to the anxieties of utility and growth, anatomies chronically luxurious. These are excessive weights sinking through the terrestrial foramen of their own bizarre and aimless assembly. What can be traced and exposed with any measure of confidence are the physical and transcendent minutia of their incandescent anatomy, paired with field reports of the cadets transmogrifying maneuvers. What follows is a document of figures in motion, whose very composition upset, upend, and cloud what before was undemanding. Radical work-shy bodies, vibrating tumors, the unthinkable discipline of the cult. Front matter 1.1, garden lung. The cadet came to clog the base of a tree standing between two gardens. GPS coordinates describe this point as 48.827589, 2.106703, summoning a landscape towards the northern extremity of Versailles. This is where, directly, from life and blistering and living vision, Jean Honor Fragonard painted the swing in the midsummer months of 1767. The bow where the swing was fixed still bears the imprints of the rope, the maturation of the branch collaborating with the swing's past requirements. At the base of this tree, 224 years later, this date coinciding with Francis Bacon's last efforts to complete study of a bull that a pit formed, the cadet, finding in this absence of shape, the perfect shape of its presence, Blanchot 35. Two dozen cadet matured here in a single permethrin treated polyester mesh bag. The breathable material, along with the relatively shallow depth and rich, loosely packed soil of the hole, 
provided ideal conditions, quivering between transparency and opacity, an intersection of alchemical fraternity for the coalescence of foundational materials. The constituent substances housed in the bag are unknown. However, it can be speculated with some certainty that traces of opal, horn, truffle, gold, and the severed heads of at least three bowls were among those contents initially interred. Part one, the oaken trunk, wood is bent narrow. The trunk, head removed and the body, being made to remain upright, then viewed in that position aerially, forms an X with its contour. The torso derives this stunning shape from its condition of being profoundly funnel-chested on either opposing side. However, funnel-chested would be inaccurate, as the torso of the cadet is in actuality <coughs> comprised of two fused backs. In this way, even in the throes of locomotion, the body denies conceit as regards direction. It is never properly going anywhere. Instead, it is perpetually leaving, even when engaged in the most rapid advance. Most vital, the trunk houses of the cadet's primary deformative engine, where the inward apexes of two central funneling bones of the backs meet. This confluence of dense tissue producing a constant tinnital hum. These shutters are by no means limited to the trunk, but resonate throughout the body, interacting with limb and organ, the vibration allowing for those masses to undulate beyond their now activated and indeterminate borders. This prized offal, a blood relic, initiating systems of athleticism and posture that manifest the symbolic and lived space. The esoteric symbol is a natural or artificial fact which elicits an abstract vital response, which will then be expressed physically, nervously, mentally, or emotionally in an organized being, or by an energetic reaction in an unorganized being, Schwaller de Lubitz, 46. A second vertical incision along the side of the torso, followed by the decoupling of the opposing backs, reveals this tinnital organ in its central position, surrounded by haphazardly developed structural tissue. This tumorous instrument is the bee's hive. First maneuver, chorus of the lodge. Two podiums under spotlight. Upon the first, a kidney, wet, poised as a ruby. On the second is Eva Hesse's Ascension II of 1968. Both occupy their stages with the weight of a corpse. The organ then opens, its walls a slow blooming algae, the cube of the sculpture now hemorrhaging in tandem, its standing panels drift apart, interior exposed. Dense networks of vinyl tubing sit in a cord as musculature. Now draw two lines outward from both the kidney and the sculpture, allow them to find intersection. It will be in a field where there is long grass. This is where the lodge stands, housing, casing, organ. The witness approaching, vision folds, throat growing lean and hollow as the jaw reclines, filling with molten gold. A gravel path descends a hill, rises to the peak of a lower one, arrives at the door of the lodge. The witness's eyes swelling now, skin of the face turns ruddy, blisters and separation. The chest doubles before the door, sensations of the first chest, enduring friction under the second as the legs propel, the flesh made ugly. This lodge, a flattened cylinder, 50 meters round and 16 high for the sake of harmony. The light, its dimness, its yellowness, floor and wall are of solid rubber or such like. Imagine then the silence of the steps, Beckett, 202, 203. Lungs of both chests wander in time with mute footfalls. Breath is heaved. Impossible horizontal expansions of the thorax ensue. Contours of the trunk expand to accommodate this prodigal operation so rapidly is to meet the attendant arms with a slap. Elbows of the struck appendant tripling in odd reaction. Derma of the local area ruptures into weeping rubber. The body now adorned as true witness, bears witness to the choir. Cadet assembled along the curvature of an edge, truncated torso laying on its side, directly in line with the center of the congregation and the view of the witness. The deflation of its form converses with the ongoing elaborations of the witnessing chest affixed now to their newly bowed legs. The chorus building, two dozen heads, mouths manifest bilaterally under a nameless power. The emissions achieved are monotony, vicious, pathological, daring in their opaline grandeur. The trunk heaves on the floor, precious metals seethe from its apertures, the obscenity, the obscenity of its movement drawing the walls to aching curvature. The, appendage of the, witness, the appendages of the witness loop inward, legs and arm now opposed half-moons. 
the groans of those bones squandered on the harmony of the choir, the bee's hive lays on the floor. Part two, mandible upon the nape or uncounted crowns. Some evidence can be cited in reference to the head. Exhibit 20 in the Thompson Collection of European Art contains a French rosary bead dated to 1540, depicting the triadic luxuries of youth, age, and death in a singular composite head form. Further, Oscar Schlemmer, in meditating on the transformative aspects of costume, invokes the metaphysical forms of expression, the double head, multiple limbs, division and suppression of forms, result, dematerialization, 27. The cadet head, then, under the environmental forces exerted by the operations of the bee's hive, is a limb of total transition. In this plastic state of constant undulation, the head is both malleable physicality and play of vapors. The structure of the head transitions laterally, crystallizing various stages of development and decomposition along this plane, manifesting an outward staring gaze on either end of this vector in cyclical intervals of varying velocity and regularity. This Janus face hologram is prismatic exuberance, the intoxication of life cycles isolated in a state of rapid animation. The force of its movement throws the body out of focus, off balance, the cadet constantly toppling over, body prone, the head's functions relentless. Its borders rupture and merge in implausible sequence, rendered as a whole in flesh, the head's modular surfaces a series of pulsating, indeterminate abstractions, while the sightless legs kick and jostle in delinquent, recumbent ecstasy. For the witness contemplating this face, enduring the pleasures of vibratory mutilation sung by the bee's hive, there are sensory outpourings granted by the head's practice, Constant undulation places the crown's structure under profound tension. Ligaments and muscle tissues undergo excessive stress. The fatigue of the meats emanate a victual perfume of marrows. The aroma acting on the witness as gas-borne opioid. The AKD realizations of the fumes transmit optically, furthering the severity of visual diffusion suggested through cadet gesture, leaving a nebulous curving of physical space in its wake. Encountering the cadet in this manner is to encounter a vision. Heavy sacks of meat crudely bonded to the spokes of a colossal wheel. This, an agential presence, subject, heap of rot, rolling jubilance. The earth is tremor, meat blurs out of focus, ground alternates between draining and blows. Limbs now buttered, anesthetized, all soft and bent. Second maneuver, what is beneath the bolt? A witness enters the barn from a large opening in the southern wall. A turn presents a central pathway. At the end stands the bull, the fullness of its form threatening to bleed the earth. The bull's head sways back and forth along a horizon marked by restraints. Below this head a recession, two feet deep, full with cadet recumbent, reclining legs wandering over themselves. Cadet layout, saliva of the bull overhead a halo, blunders out of that hung mouth, topping them, they, great patches of bound skin, stir as dunes. Picture the two bourgeois sculptures they had at the Tate, the ones from 67, the soft landscapes as animated frames. The molds of the plastic strobing violently in forward and reverse sequence. The fluctuation between frames evoking more Bridgian space. The movements of bodies refusing their livelihood of physical division, slapping at the borders of neighbors. The hides of the two bounding inside one another superheated plastics erupting beyond industry. As the bull's head rocks, the reposeful cadet perforate wildly, flesh lost in a convulsion of shimmering polyethylene states in the lowness of the barn. These transitory material raptures, occasionally marked by the brief appearance of heavy leathers, feeded, untanned, the fury of the bull goaded by the reek of its own dead. Part three, wither of lungs, dancing tumescence, sitting amongst the bathers, and on the airs. The leg and foot of the cadet are bound through an oscillation between rigidity and radical pliability. The low appendage, removed from the body and cut deeply through the center of the leg, reveals a troubling cross-section. No bone proper, instead a stratum of viscous cavities ever capable of rapid modification toward the rigid by way of thickening to a resinous keratin. The connective point between the foot and the lower leg is jointless. Instead, a fold sits in place a hybridity between crude rubber and a hard fungus acting as a binder for the overburdened pleat. The mass of the foot is composed of similar chambers to those of the thigh and calf. 
Movement is achieved through the actions of the cavities struggling under stipulations outlined by the tinnitus of the bee's hive. Entering states of hyperventilation, the pouches act as alarmed lungs running the length of the limb, thereby enabling the transience of the body over ground by functioning as drunken vascular tissues, fluctuating between near solidity and cascading plasticity. There have been <coughs> proximate legs to those of the cadet. In 1951, Maya Dare and choreographed and filmed ensemble for somnambulists. The body's picture are suspended in groundless space. Legs pulsate under the force of a glowing inverted possession, finding occasional resistance upon a groundless stage. As limbs touch down, finding tension, their status shifts between states analogous to those of the mobile cadet leg. At 3.32, dancers meet, the legs all aching dynamism, the slackness of pliability laboring outwards from tension towards affective movement. What follows is the trepidation of 5.38, where the ensemble is all but ossification, wooden, legs fused, inelastic as teak, vibrating with the force of idols. For the witness, the behavior of the legs under power promotes sibling reactions in their own. Those of the cadet, jointless, near rubberized, act on the appendages of their viewer with comic jealousy. As the joints the cadet lacks soon swell in the limbs of the watcher, the balls of the knee and ankle dilate such violence as to ground the body. Unable to kneel or sit cross-legged from awkwardness, the witness sits flat, legs stretched out before them, the weight of the freshly augmented sections reaching beyond the capacities of the bone and tissue, pulling them to the earth. This imposed posture threatens to take on the permanence of statuary. The witness, delirious, removes a small knife from a pocket, incises the surface of the kneecap, stratum revealed, first mucus and bone, then lead, in the center, four is a diamond. Third maneuver, Lawn Walker, Hell Struts of Van Gogh. The sack like curvatures of the right leg found in Bacon's study for a portrait of Van Gogh, too, invoke the cadet's relationship to the lawn, describing an intoxicating deflation of limbs. The organs of the walker sag asymmetrically towards the base of the right heel as the figure strives through the landscape. Those conservative margins defined by the walls of the thorax, finally guarded by the droll rigidity of the hips soften and pour open with the action of the leg in struggle. Kidney, lung, gallbladder drain away to the soft fissure, crowding the muscul musculature of the thigh with terminal abundance. Painted in 1957, the picture is a sibling image to the two, two, 2007 video footage of the Fresno Nightcrawler. Between seconds 53 and 58, the right leg of the bipedal cryptid moves as if in tandem with Van Gogh's leg across a rolling lawn. The imp of athletic hilarity, the body wanders with no hope of arrest, with no promise of addition, but as insensible appendage to the sensed, charming the space, softening what surrounds with gestures irretrievable to calls of growth. Witness this walk in the yard, the breadth of the legs lost to throes of hypermobility, invasive joints, tumorous nodes of ruptures emerging throughout the extension of the limb, midway through the thigh a contusion the earliest symptom of a swelling and mound, a partially functioning ball joint emerges from this fibroid, low leg the same, shin soft as a nose. Structurally, the limb is unsound, spandex trousers are odd sculpture, total rigidity impossible, the leg inflamed. Liquid networks develop from the plush interiors hollowed out of form. Flows of fast-moving urethane mingle, with ru and mingle and ruin hydra silver, meeting the rubber blood of the hive, the limb now bouncing, heels lively and buoyant with the foam of their butchery. What walked, bliss and gestation. The witness sitting in a plastic chair, body pitching in minute, steady rhythm. Imagine having seen it. The lungs hum something to retain, to replace the vacancy of the bee's hive. Hands and forearms dance before the torso, shaping something invisible over the ribs attempting to make the folds of their object physical through the weave of the fingers. Imagine having seen those adorned, those in their drool of earth. Head leans back, mouth smiling so wide, the jaw wide, mouth smiling a smile like eating. A stuttering incandescence refracts upon the gold of teeth in these mouths so beautiful.